I am stuck. So welcome to the invited tutorial by Professor Amir Al Abadi. is a distinguished professor of computer science and UC Santa Barbara. He obtained his uh, engineering and PhD degree from Alexandria and Cornell universities respectively. So he's an editor of uh, VLDB journals and uh, I guess IEEE transactions and uh, computers. So he was named as uh, IEEE fellow in 2014 for his contribution to the fault tolerant uh, large scale data management system. So he'll talk about uh, Metadata price based voice uh, communication system for untrusted uh, infrastructure. So, over to Professor. Thank you. Thanks for all the diehards who have managed to wait till now. Uh, thanks for, wait, for staying and uh, listening to me. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. And while I'm speaking, if there is something that you don't understand, don't hesitate to stop me. So, as you probably know, we've been very interested in managing large-scale data. And once one starts managing large-scale data, one is obliged to often store the data with other entities because typically you don't have enough storage to store all that you need. Whether you are working on machine learning, whether you are working on social networks, whether you're working on scientific applications, you often end up storing the data somewhere else. Once I start storing the data somewhere else, I'm worried about privacy, the privacy of the information. So the focus of the talk today is actually not about storing data in a private way, but introducing to you in a step-by-step -step fashion how one can support privacy at a very large scale. The problem is that I have large data and I can use a lot of the cryptographic techniques that people have developed. They are, they, people, cryptographers have done an amazing job for the last 40 years. Problem is that cryptographers focus on encrypting and decrypting the data. And typically they are interested in short messages short pieces of information. The problem we have now is the scale that we have to deal with. So what I'm going to do today is to show you how I can scale for even a communication network. So message passing. I want, I have senders and receivers and they want to talk to each other. And encryption, just encrypting the data itself is not enough. I am also worried about revealing who is sending the data to whom? So, in other words, we are worried about metadata about the information. The information itself can be encrypted. That's done. The problem is how do I make sure that the, the information about the data can also be maintained in a private way? We are going to use techniques that are actually quite useful in large-scale databases, and you'll very soon see how this goes on. So let me start for the first five minutes by just giving you a high-level idea of the problems that we face in privacy, and then I'll delve into the problem we are facing. So we know how to encrypt data. There are traditional ways that have been done. So we can just encrypt the data. The problem is once I have a big database, I don't, are you hearing me still? Okay. Once I have a large database, a database is not just a string that needs to be encrypted. It actually has multiple things about it, yeah? It's very big, I've talked about this. It has structure. It is not just a string. It's, if you have a relational database, it has attributes, it has fields, etc. Even if it's a simple key value store, you have a key and a value. So there is structure. Data is accessed in very different ways. Data can be asked using exact queries, select Al Abedi's record, or select everybody whose age is between 20 and 30. That's a range query. You have all kinds of interesting queries that one can ask about. Last but not least, data is also updated. It's not static. 
So there are lots of problems. Unfortunately, I cannot in an hour and a half delve into all these. But I want you to be aware of the fact that databases, you cannot just use the standard approaches. We have to approach it in a different way. We are not going to, and, that, and I'm not a cryptographer, we are not going to invent new cryptographic techniques. What we have to do is to try and develop methods to make it scalable, to make it adaptive to this approach, to these challenges, yeah? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm more of, a, I'm approaching this more of as a systems designer who has been given theoretical tools, but that are cumbersome. This is kind of the gist of what we're doing. So in a standard cloud computing context, I can, Alice can store her data in the cloud, for example, but storing it even encrypted is not enough. Why do we have data? To query it, to do something with it. So obviously Alice wants to ask questions and get back answers. If I'm going to encrypt the data, I have a problem, yeah? The database cannot help me find what I want if it's encrypted. There are techniques, and I'm going to explore this, but standard kind of naive approaches don't just do it. So we have to think of ways in which to approach this. So I want to store data in an encrypted way, in a private way, and still be able to take advantage of it. Otherwise, I would always have to re-get the whole database and decrypt it at but then I might as well keep the whole thing stored in my place. Yeah? You, you see the tension that we have. Okay. So there are security concerns, and it's basically confidentiality of data, and the typical solution is encryption. And our goal is to develop, this is not my goal, the field in general. That's looking at privacy with databases, or data in general is to develop techniques that can answer them even with, without fetching the entire database. That's g one goal. Another, is that enough? And I'm going to argue, no, it's not enough. So these are basically what I just said. Uh, I should uh, just tell you for the, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be assuming that the adversary, the pr provider who has the data, is honest but curious, meaning they are not necessarily malicious. One can develop techniques for malicious, but I'm going to assume that they are just observing what is happening and deducing things from it, using other kinds of information. So it's a semi-benign type of behavior. Okay, so is encrypting the data enough? And the answer is no, encrypting it is not enough. Why? Because access patterns leak information. And this has been established in the community for a while. If you have a sequence of operations, if Alice goes and accesses A, and then Bob comes and accesses A again, then they, the the provider knows that both of them are interested in the same type of information, at least. That's step number, one of the things that they can deduce. If they know something about that this is a medical database, then Bob and Alice both have the medic same medical problem. Now, if the provider collides with Alice, then they know what is Bob's problem, yeah? So this is what I want you to be thinking about. This is the background kind of for how I want you to approach this. So here is another example. You have a medical database with different types of medicines. And let's say it's encrypted. So you store it in the database and it's gibberish. As far as the database, the provider is concerned, it's all just a string of zeros and ones that they don't understand what it means. However, if you end up having different clients accessing the pattern for a long time, you can develop 
a histogram of how are people accessing this database. And the database is a database of ailments, of diseases people have. Now, if the adversary happens to know that in reality, diabetes is this much percent in the population, uh, hypertension is this much percent in the population, then just the access pattern will reveal what is happening. So it's not enough that the confidentiality of the data itself is enough. It's not enough to have my record hidden. Just my accessing it or other people, access, my doctor accessing it and all of that can result in information. So we want to make sure that we do not reveal the access pattern itself. So the sequence of queries and their corresponding accesses in the physical database can result in access privacy and data breaches that are very problematic. So data privacy, sensitive data needs to be kept private. And encryption is a good start, but it's not enough. And finally, access pattern is important. So you figure out, the adversary figures out, an honest but curious, they answer everything correctly, so they are not acting maliciously. There's a whole other part of privacy that deals with malicious failures and what's called Byzantine failures. So that's not. But which item is being accessed, when it was accessed, how frequently an item is accessed, you can figure out things based on this. Hot items imply something. If everybody is accessing, uh, what is the name, VMCC today, then they will know that a lot of people are coming to this conference, yeah? And then they know that you are going to this conference. And then they are going to start telling you something, advertising or something, yeah? So this is how, without really knowing what VMCC is, I didn't know actually when I came, I just wandered around. So the access pattern can leak a lot of information. So what we are going to try and do is to develop, and people have been working on this problem for a while. And we want it to be scalable and efficient. So I put on a hat of a systems designer where I am worried about scale and efficiency. And I'm going to try and show you through this uh, talk how this is a pro this can be a problem if I'm not very careful. I'm not going to solve all the problems I talked about. I'm going to focus on a very particular tight problem. It's a group communication problem. So it's actually a simple problem, and I think you will understand it. And then I can show you how we can develop techniques that are actually critical for data access. And this was work that we recently had in uh, OSDI, uh, and it's mainly the work of uh, my student, Ishtiaq Ahmed. So, voice communication is ubiquitous, and you want to be able to communicate. Groups of people want to communicate with each other. We can assume that everybody in the COMAD community here wants to exchange messages. So, and we want to provide privacy, so we could encrypt it using standard encryption techniques. So for example, hello could be encrypted and then sent to the server. The server figures out where to de the destination is and sends it to Bob. Now, the server does not know what was in the message. The hunter, but is it enough? And I've argued already that it is not enough. We've already revealed who the participants are. It's Alice and Bob trying to talk to each other. We know when they were talking to each other. Makes a difference if you call in the morning or in the evening. There is, uh, you can deduce information about this. Are you talking for a long time or a short time? All of these things are being revealed without the content being relevant. 
So we call this metadata. So our goal in this talk is going to be to hide metadata from the provider, from the server. And there are, there's this horrible quote where uh, we can we kill the data based on metadata. This was the chief of the CIA who said this. So they are used really for, you know, like drones when they go and uh, shoot people. So this problem has been studied for a while. And here is another example. If you have a, if somebody access the cardiological group first in a medical center, then goes to a medical lab, and then finally calls a hotline for cardiac arrhythmia, then you can figure out what is happening without even knowing what the patient was talking about, yeah? Just by knowing that he talked to all these people. So voicemail, voice call metadata can be used for mass surveillance. So if you're a whistleblower, yeah, somebody who reports on what is happening bad in a company, then they're going to be revealed. The problem at the moment, well, prior to our work, was that either you don't have privacy or you don't have the scale. So how many people can, com can communicate with each other? So if the x-axis is privacy, where zero is no privacy, and one is 100% privacy, just some metric, it doesn't matter what, and the y-axis is number of users that we, can, that we can support, there are basically DC networks-based broadcast messages that can provide complete privacy but are actually can only support 10 to 50 people. At the other end, there was a system called Yodel, which uses a shuffling network, and it pro can support over a million customers, users talking to each other, but unfortunately, it doesn't provide very high privacy. What we are going to propose, which is ADRA, it's not the perfect solution yet, so don't lose hope. There is still work to be done. Is that we can provide complete privacy, however, and we can support up to 32K users, so 32,000, so in the tens of thousands. Ideally, we would like to go to more, but this is what the state of the art is now. So if we have a set of senders and a set of recipients, they could be the same. You don't want to reveal who is a sender, who is the receiver, and you can assume that the network is compromised. You can assume that some of the senders are compromised. You can assume some of the recipients are compromised or going to collaborate with each other. That is all. So it's a really quite a robust system that sense. So there are two main challenges we have to address. One of them is unlinking the caller and the callee so that the provider, the service, doesn't know that Amr is talking to Atul. Yeah? We want that. So decoupling the sender and the receiver. So if A is talking to somebody, you don't know that A is talking to B. The second problem, which is what is really the hard problem, is how to achieve this with very low latency and still achieve the numbers that we get in the tens of thousands. The first challenge is actually, I'll explain it quite quickly. The second one is what's going to take most of the time. So we want these to be talking to each other and it's still being reasonable so that you can have real communication. Okay, so let's see how we're going to make this happen. We are going to use a technique which is called private information retrieval. Has anybody in the room heard about this before, PIR? No, okay. 
So I'm going to use a database technique, an information retrieval type of technique, and that's why this is in a COMAD conference, to solve the communication problem. Yeah. So I'm going to use a database problem, uh, kind of mechanism to solve a database problem. Problem is that it doesn't scale very well if you take it as it is. So we had to develop our no, new private information technique that provides faster processing time. So is everybody understanding what I'm trying to do? I'm going to solve the first problem by telling you an architecture, basically, of how to make two people, lots of people actually communicate with each other using private information retrieval. And then I'll tell you, if I use what we have now, I would be in dead water. So I have to do something better, and I'll work on that. And that will make me sweat a lot more. So clients wish to outsource data in general to an untrusted party. That's the database information retrieval problem. An honest but curious adversary will observe who is talking to who, what cells are being accessed. Yeah. We need to keep both the data and the access patterns private. So if I have a client one and a client two, and client one sets the array A1 to V, and client two accesses A1 and figures out the value is V, the store should never learn about V and the store should never learn that the client accessed entry one. Okay, so there are two things. One of them is that the V, the content is preserved and that will use just standard cryptographic techniques. But the more difficult one that I want to you to be aware of in this presentation is that the server should not know that I access this entry and not any of these. So just think about it. You have basically an array, and you want to ask the storage device to give you entry number i without the storage knowing i, but still giving you the value. Sounds like magic if you haven't seen this before. There are actually, this problem has been studied since the 90s. So there are two main approaches, PIR, and ORAN, and we could use one of the two. We ended up using PIR. I'll give you, I uh, yes, I'm going to give you a, a one slide summary of ORAN, just to get the idea of how it works, and then focus on PIR, okay? So, what you want to do is to make all data accesses sound as though they look to the server as though they are random. How do I do this? Let's assume all I'm going to do is support put and get. So you put data and you get it, yeah? Uh, key value store, yeah? You are familiar with what I'm talking about. You, everybody knows what a key value store is, yeah? Yes. Raise your hands, I need some react. Okay, good. So what an ORAM does is typically you have clients. They have some trusted proxy which is close to them. So you say IIT might have its own trusted proxy here and the storage might be in Amazon land somewhere in Seattle or Delhi or something like that. The data is encrypted. The trusted entity knows about the encryption key. It also has some information to be. The network and the storage device can be controlled by the adversary. So what we do is we store the data in ORAM, like a tree. So you have entities, you just store them in a, like a, you can think of a binary search tree, if you want, or a B tree. B plus tree, whatever your favorite thing is. But typically, it's a binary search tree looking thing. When a client once 
an entry, what it does, let's say it wants this red one. It asks for the entire path from the root to the leaf. So the storage device doesn't know out of this log n entries which one I'm interested in. So it's hidden among log n. That's number one. So you get log n entries. Not only that, after you've read it, you shuffle it and you send it back to a different location. You put it over there and you say, I'm going to store it in that path from that root to that leaf. Actually, what happens in ORAM is you identify the place you want by the leaf. So it's the path that goes from the root to a leaf, which is unique. So, so as a result, not only has the, the server doesn't know when it gives you the data, which one out of log n entries, but the next time I ask for the question, the same entry, I'm going to ask a different entry. I'm going to give a different leaf. I'm going to give this leaf instead of this one. So it will not know that I'm asking both times about my account, for example. That's the very high level idea of ORAM. So, and ORAM, there's a lot of work on this and we can spend hours talking about it. And there's very good work. Now, our focus is on PIR, private information retrieval. You have a database, a key value store, which stores all this stuff. It's all encrypted. So for, for now, just don't worry about the content at all. And the client basically wants entry I, and it's going to send it, and will get the answer without revealing to the client that it wants I. So how do we do this? That's what it wants to do. So PIR provides this, and I'm going to give you how it does this. But let's see, let's go back to our problem. I want to have 32,000 people talk to 32,000 people without revealing anything. And I want to use this PIR idea, how we are going to use it. We're going to create mailboxes. You're all familiar with mailboxes. Do you have a mailbox? Or virtual, it doesn't matter. Yes, you do. What we're going to do is if, but if you want to communicate with me, you typically put your message in my mailbox. What we are going to do is we are going to have you put it in your mailbox and I'm going to take it out of it. So we've kind of switched this idea of mailboxes. So Alice owns number two. So if she wants to communicate with anybody, she's going to put her information, her messages in entry number two. And now Bob, when he wants to retrieve the message that Alice sent him because he's talking to Alice, he's going to use PIR to retrieve that entry. So he's going to ask a query, the same picture you saw in the last slide. He's going to ask for entry number two to send me the information. And if PIR magic works, then the server will not know that Bob is talking to Alice. Because Alice put it in her mailbox, big deal, but the server doesn't know where did baby Bob picked it. He doesn't know who he picked it from. Yeah. So this is the basic architecture. So we are using this database concept to solve a communication problem. And this is what computer scientists, I think, are good at, yeah? Is we use, we have a bag of techniques and we are faced with new problems and we use our solved problems to solve new problems. I'm a database guy, I tend to think in those terms, but maybe I'm too narrow, but it's okay, it works here. Yeah. 
So our system is going to work on one at a time. You can communicate for a while with Bob, and then after a while, she'll decide to switch. But good question. So that's future work. Uh, this doesn't take care into account about the timestamp issue which you mentioned. So, time stamp. Uh, so at a particular instance, when Alice puts the message into her own mailbox and Bob picks it out, uh, we still know that at this point of time is where this, this exchange of messages happened. There was an exchange of messages. It's not clear whether Alice was talking to Bob or Christopher or Jane. And she could be talking to anybody. And we don't know. And there are the duration. I can send several messages. So let me show you the next slide. So what we can do also is not only that, we can now have Alice communicate with somebody else. And she can, and then this person can query it and get it. That's another communication. But she cannot talk to two at the same time. And not only that, to answer your question, I think it's the next slide. We can use the same query for the entire communication. So presumably, Alice is going to send several communication. Yeah, so this vice communication. So she's going to say to put message number one, message number two, message number three, and all of this is going to go through to Bob, yeah? We, all we have to do is to do a transfer of two hops. So one, two. So we actually try to do this in a scalable manner, so we have several processes that are doing this. You don't have to worry about it too much, but we can have several workers and a coordinator, and the protocol is round-based. So you send a message, you send another message. So it's rounds, and there's an initial dialing phase where you communicate with each other. You agree that Alice is talking to Bob or whatever, and then there's a communication phase, and the communication phase goes quickly and keeps on sending messages continuously. So if you have a set of, of, a set of clients that want to communicate, they're going to put some queries, the queries are going to be distributed among the workers, and then when the communication happens, so the dialing phase is Bob saying, I want to query for number two, and Atul says he wants the query for number five, etc. And then in the sub-rounds, you end up sending messages, everybody puts in their own mailboxes, they get to the coordinator, to, 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 to ensure privacy, those set of messages are sent to all the workers who end up propagating the relevant ones to whoever is interested in them. So that was the basic architecture, which is how to use an, a PIR type of system to solve a communication problem. Now we want to look at the harder problem, which is how to make sure that I do this efficiently. And to do that, I have to convince you that just using what we have is not efficient. So if you look at it, the communication, has the, the whole latency from Alice to Bob takes three things. There's from Alice to the server, there's processing of the query to figure out that how to do this query number two, entry number two, and then there's the sending back. So this is network and this is processing. It's the processing that is the challenge we have. The network is fast. So current PIR techniques, there are several that have been around. One is XPIR, another one is seal PIR. we are going to propose fast PIR. And although we are using it here for communication, we can use it for other things, yeah? 
we use something which I'm going to explain, something that, so how to do the magic, that's the problem, is how do I ask for entry number I and not reveal it? We're going to use cryptographic techniques called homomorphic encryption. If you haven't heard about it, I'm going to explain it. So to do this, I need to explain just a little bit about encryption because I'm not sure many here know about encryption, yeah? You know some, okay, good. Anybody else knows anything? Two, three, oh, there's more, okay. Then I can go quicker. But if you want me to go slower, I can too. So I'm going, it's going to go very fast, so don't worry. It's not going to be boring for the ones who know. Basically, at the very beginning, there was what's called symmetric encryption. So you have plain text attack at dawn. You have some, method, some function that takes the letters and obfuscates them. So for example, and this is a very naive example just to illustrate, you could say add to the ASCII 3. So now, instead of sending attack at noon, you send this gibberish. It's symmetric. Why is it symmetric? Because the, 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 the decryption is just subtract three. So once we agree the sender and the receiver on the number three, then both sides can talk to each other. And for the adversary, they don't know, is it three, is it 100, is it a million, is it 10, nine? You know, it could be anything, at least modulo 26, so it's a challenge. So that's easy. I'll go through this quickly. So you basically have a key. So that was just a simple example. But the basic idea of symmetric encryption is you have a key, you encrypt using that key, and then you have the symmetric, the opposite, the complement of it for decryption. And you get the recipient. And the technique I described is deterministic. If I send something, I have three, it's always encrypted in the same way. So there's a whole bunch of symmetric encryption keys called that are deterministic. Problem with deterministic is, as I said, with access patterns, if somebody's observing, they will say, hey, this guy is always sending the same message in the morning. This sounds suspicious. And they can deduce something. Maybe they observe that I go and have breakfast, then they know that this guy is talking about breakfast or something. So instead, there are actually non-deterministic approaches where you take a key, a, 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 a cipher, a, a plain text, and encrypt it. And if you take the same one again and again, you'll get with different encrypted cipher texts. So those are called non-deterministic. They are more expensive but they are more robust and secure. So the problem with encryption in general and cryptographic techniques is the more secure, the more expensive. It takes a lot of work. So a standard approach is private and public encryption, where basically you have a private key and a public key. That's asymmetric encryption here. And basically, Alice keeps a private key and advertises her public key. And if somebody wants to send a message to Alice, they encrypt it using her public key and they send it on the network. Anybody can see it, nobody will understand it because nobody knows her private key. Once the message arrives using the private key, they can actually decrypt it. So this works quite well. And this is asymmetric encryption. And this is very famous, uh, basically, it's the RSA or due to uh, Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman from 78. So this is very old, established cryptographic techniques. And I'm going to go through this quickly. Basically, you can do double, double exponentiation, modulo something, and you get the same thing. So if I have a private key D and a public key E, then I, to encrypt, I end up taking the message, the plain text, taking the exponent, modulo some domain size. This is ring operation, so there's a domain size. And you get some encrypted value. At the other end, because we know that 
the exponentiation happens in either direction. It doesn't matter, commutative. So I can actually decrypt it by raising it to the power d, and then I get the plain text. OK, this is kind of straightforward. What's interesting here, and the reason I'm doing this, is that I could do multiplication of the encrypted values. So I can have two encrypted values, encrypted. Give them to somebody I don't trust. And then ask that person, please multiply those two numbers. They don't know what the numbers are, but they know the encrypted strings. They can actually do the operation on the encrypted strings, give me the answer, and now I decrypt it and I get the multiplication. Why? Because of the power of exponentiation. So like it's m to the e if I have another message. So m1, m1 to the e, e a message m2, m2 to the e. If you multiply them, what do you end up getting? You end up multiplying these two, which is really m1 times m2 to the power e. And so this is the encrypted value. So you see, I can now, this is the idea, is that we can do things. We can have a server do operations on data that they don't understand, that is gibberish to them, that is encoded to them, and yet do useful work for me and return it. So I don't have to do the multiplication. This is, uh, uh, I think, an important concept. So I can basically, the product of the encrypted two messages is an encryption of the product of the two messages. So that's very nice. That's great, yeah? So we can ask untrusted parties to do work for us without compromising privacy. These are old results. I'm just bringing them out because they highlight this. There's actually one that works for addition. And it was due to Goldwasser and Mikali. I'll skip it since I think we are running out of time. But basically, you can do mul you can ask the server to do multiplication of the values. The way they do it is using exponentiation again, and it ends up being the equivalent of addition. So you end up with the addition additive addition of the two values. It's kind of neat. So the product of the encryption of two messages is an encryption of the sum of the two messages. So the basic message out of all of this is we want to do homomorphic encryption at its essence. Those are just examples, simple examples, are basically a way in which certain types of computation can be carried out on encrypted cipher texts and still reveal things to me and without the server doing anything. And this is the whole goal, like I've said, with the database problem, is I want the server to help me solve problems without compromising the data. So homomorphic encryption has been the rage for a few years now, I mean, a few decades now. There was basically examples like I gave you, but a little bit more sophisticated, more efficient, et cetera. A partial homomorphic encryption, there's Pellier and Del Gamal. They either do addition or multiplication, one of the two. The challenge was for a while how to do both of them. So these are relatively efficient, meaning it can be done at a reasonable time. There was a breakthrough in 2009 by Gentry which basically supports compute any kind of computation. And that is fully homomorphic encryption. The problem is that it isn't very efficient from a large scale point of view, from a data management message passing point of view, the problem I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's a great technique, but it has a lot of challenges. So this is what we are going to try and do with you now, is how to kind of do this in an efficient way. So for any function f, ideally for any function f, given a set of messages m1 through mi or mt, I can encrypt them. And then using some key, some private key, you can do a function 
on these different encrypted values and you get a value that you give back and it has the result of the function itself. So you are getting, in my examples, I was either doing multiplication or addition. So there's a specific set of a package, actually a software package, due to these BVF homomorphic encryption, which is available. You can get it, actually Microsoft has it available. It's a fast implementation of fully homomorphic encryption. FHE, fully homomorphic encryption. And uh, there's this Microsoft seal, which is an open library, and we used it in our experiments. So the way basically this whole thing works is the plain text is a vector of entries, all of them modulo P. So you have N entries, capital N. Here is some notation that I'll be using throughout the rest of the talk. So you need to kind of just remember these. N, capital N is the num, the size of the vector. In the plain text, each entry is modulo P. So if I have a text, I end up breaking it up into enough components. If I, if I need N to be bigger, I'll pad it with some empty stuff. And basically, it represents a polynomial. So a polynomial of degree n, where those are the coefficients, these eight entries. Eight is n, capital N here. So the entries, which are all modulo p, are going to be the coefficients of a polynomial of degree n. You encrypt it into a cipher text, which is, again, of has n entries, capital N, the same size, but the entries are modulo Q. Yeah, so it's a different size of a domain. And I'm going to give you some constraints on them that are needed to ensure correct, efficient encryption. Basically, the encryption adds noise to each of these entries, adds some noise. And as you do more operations on the entries, you increase the noise. And as a result, your accuracy, your accuracy reduces. So you have to be careful not to do too much of it. So the assumption, the, wor the way it works, like I said, with public and private encryption, you need a private key and a public key. Here, you also need two keys. It's asymmetric. So you have A and S, which are two polynomials, and the coefficients are in P. That's like the, the, the clear text. And basically, you're going to have, the key is going to be two components, an A, which is one of the polynomials, and another one, which is the multiplication of A times S plus some amount of error or noise that is added. Okay, so I'm going to have two components. A, that's the encryption key. A, which is a polynomial, and A times S, both of them polynomials, plus some noise that we're going to add. The assumption is, and you have to pick A, A and S, so that it's hard to calculate S given the multiplication of A times S. This is always the problem in encryption, is you give two numbers and they are factor, they can be factored, but you don't know how to factor them because those are very big numbers, yeah? So the secret key is the pol random polynomial S and the public key is going to be the multiplication of A times S plus the E and the A. So this is the public key what I was talking about there, and what is hidden, what only the secret knower for the decryption is, is S. Okay, so how do I deal with this? Given a plain polynomial, we encrypt the message using the public key. It's like what I described with the asymmetric encryption. You encrypt using the public key, and then you decrypt using the private key. 
What is the public key? It's the pair, AS plus E, comma A. So the two, the pair, yeah? So how do you do it? You generate some random polynomial, some other random polynomial, U. And the first component is going to be AS plus E, which is the first component of the public key, multiply it times this random number, yeah? So you'll get AS U plus E times U, which is, again, since both of them are random numbers, we'll assume it's just E for simplicity. The second component is your message, M, multiply times Q. Does anybody still remember what Q is? Q is the domain of the entries in the ciphertext. So it's Q divided by P times M. So I end up with this long expression. Why am I doing all this? I'm doing it so that I can show you how to do the decryption. So the second component is going to be A times U, the nonce, and I send all this stuff. So the ciphertext is this polynomial plus this polynomial, AU plus this. Yeah, so it's two components. So the recipient receives this, and they have the key. So what do they do? They take the second component and multiply it times S. S is the private key. So I had the private key. I, ha I just multiply it. I get this value. Now, if you've been following me, you can subtract this from this. And what do you get? You get Q times P divided by M. Q divided by M times Q divided by P times M. Q is known, P is known, so I can figure out the M. So basically, I ended up sending a pair and doing some magic. You don't have to really follow all of it. Just I give it so that you believe it's. I'm not making up things, but. If it, you can actually do the subtraction and you get the value, the message. So if you didn't follow the last two slides, it's, it's OK. I think you'll follow the rest. So there are some lots of interesting things. To ensure security, we need to make sure that n is big. Yeah, remember, I want to make sure that you cannot factor things. So I have to make sure that it's a hard problem. Factor, big number factorization is a hard problem. So n is a power of 2. That's very big. The maximum value of q is determined by n, and the maximum value of p is also determined by q. So there's a connection between all of these different components. And q has to be much larger than p. So. To reduce the cyber text, I would like small n's. However, to encode concisely in plain text, I need big p's. But then q has to be much bigger than p. So I, I have a problem of numbers, of sizes. Remember, all this has to be bits and bytes. So let's assume n is 4k. It's not, uh, not bad. I mean. So based on these, then Q can be at most 109 bits, which really translates to 16 bytes. Keep these numbers in your mind. This puts a constraint on P, because remember, Q must be much larger than P. So we already decided what Q is, so now P cannot be bigger than 19 bits. So my sizes of my texts are really going to get big in a, in a very easy way. So each cipher text is now n 
capital N, which is 4K, times 109 bytes, bits. Yeah, remember, that's the, the entry is always modulo Q. So I need to multiply 4K N times 109. 109 is 16 bytes, which ends up being 64K bytes. So every message that is being sent out is 64K bytes. What can I do with homomorphic encryption? I can do addition. I'm going to do this quicker since I'm going slowly. So if I have two encrypted vectors now, long vectors, n, most of my examples, n is equal to eight. Sometimes it's four because of the size of the slide. So let's assume I have both of these and they are both encrypted. They're kind of, this is supposed to be darker in color. So what we can do is we can do the addition of the two vectors bitwise, entry-wise. I'm not going to bore you with the math, but if you follow the math, I can basically take these polynomials, add them up, and it does do the addition. Noise increases, you see here, with addition. So every time I add, add something, it's resulting in more noise. I can do multi scalar multiplication. So if I have two vectors, the left one is encrypted, the right one is in plain text, then I can multiply them by each other and I get this information. And again, you can do the, the polynomial multiplication and you get that information. We can also do rotation. So given a key rotation, a public key for rotation, I can rotate it by a number of shifts. So for example, if I have an encrypted file, an encrypted vector, I can move it two, three, four. And using a key, I can do that. So for example, if I have a key for two rotations, then I can use it for two and everything is shifted modulo arithmetic circular. So you get this. So the three basic operations that we're going to use from this seal from homomorphic encryption is going to be addition of encrypted text, scalar multiplication, and rotation, moving things around. The error depends on the number of operations, the type of operation, and the order of operations. So I have to be also careful. Why am I doing this? Is to motivate you to understand why we were doing what we ended up doing. Is because you end up adding the way in which I do things has an effect. Remember, addition. So for example, consider a cipher text with some initial noise. Noise growth for scalar multiplication depends on the current noise. So it's a function of the current noise. So noise after scalar multiplication ends up being E0 plus an P, a co some constant times that, that error. Noise growth for rotation is independent of the initial noise. You always add a certain constant amount of noise. So as a result, if I have to do rotation and multiplication and addition, you can figure out that it's not the, the result is not the same, whether the order is important. So for example, if I have a vector A like this, and we actually want it to look like this. So I want to multiply it and shift it. I have two options. I either shift and multiply or multiply and rotate or rotate and then multiply. So if I do the scalar multiplication and then the rotation, I end up, for example, doing this. I end up multiplying. And then the error is now a function of E0 plus P times E0. Yeah, I, we agreed on this from the last slide. Plus some amount of constant to do the rotation, to shift it around. 
if I do the rotation first, then I end up adding a constant amount of error. And then when I do the multiplication, I multiply times that error. So you end up with a much bigger polynomial, which is equal to the error that I had before plus actually an amount. So in this case, you don't want to do the rotation followed by the scalar multiplication. You want to do the multiplication first. So whenever you are using these tools, just be very careful about how to order the operations because it makes a difference. Okay, let's... So, let's go back to our original problem. I have a database, and I'm interested in entry, in the first entry. How am I going to get it without revealing to the database how I did it? If you got tired uh, before, I'm kind of moving away from the theoretical development and to the techniques in, that we're going to use. So it should be different. It should be interesting, at least from my point of view, because this is where we start to do our work. So the basic idea is, if I have a database like this and I want an entry, I can send a vector that is one for the entry that I'm interested in and zero in the other ones. And using scalar multiplication, I can get the value that I'm interested in without revealing to the database what is interest, what I'm doing. So let's say I did this. So I have one and all the rest is zeros. I multiply it. I ask the database to multiply them. In our case, it's the server that's doing the communication, but we've forgotten about that problem. So what does he get? He gets a vector, all of it encrypted. They don't know anything. And uh, they don't, it's non-deterministic encryption. So zeros, they don't know if it's a zero or a one. These zeros might look different also. And then what I can even do more is I can ask it to add all these entries. The addition of all these entries is still just A. Now that is the answer I'm interested in. So this is how I can use an untrusted component, an untrusted server, to do selection, database selection, on encrypted data without revealing the pattern, the query that I'm interested in. I'm not, I didn't invent this. This is, has been known in, uh, for a while. I mean, this is understood. The challenge we have is how to do this efficiently. But I think the first step, if you go out of this room just remembering this, that's actually pretty good because you will know how to do retrieval in a private manner, at least at a high level. Okay. So the original message, now let's go back. Everything that I explained, I have to do it now for in real, yeah? So I have to find the message. I have to encode it to plain text. I have to, irrespective of the data type, consider it. So let's assume that I have some text. Uh, I need to first make this vector of size n, remember? Uh, homomorphic encryption requires vectors of size n where each of them is modulo p. Yeah, that's the plain text. So let's take this example, Amra in India. So that's 10 characters. Each of them is eight bytes, ASCII. Let's put it in hex. You don't have to understand, follow all the details, but basically I can take A and put it in hex m and put it in hex, each of these letters and put the corresponding in hex. And then that gives me a string of 80 bits. Since p is 17, 
from my previous discussion, we'll have to split it into 16-bit slices. So we end up with two of these together, and this becomes the text. This becomes the plain text that I need to encrypt. So it's not unreasonable to ask for the plain text to be a vector of size n where each component is modulo p. We can do this. This was just a simple demonstration. OK, so here is, the, I've put on the top the big picture. I'm going to ask queries. That is basically a vector with one one, with a single one. You do the multiplication, and then you do the addition. OK, so there are two challenges we have now. Remember, the query is what is asking for which entry. The query is quite big. Why? Because the ciphertext, it is the ciphertext. Remember, each of these entries now is going to be encrypted, yeah? So it's the ciphertext times the size of the database. If I want to support 32 people, remember, we have communication with, I'm going to say I'm interested in, talk, in getting the messages in mailbox number 3,512. So, I have to be able to send a vector that is of size 32K. So 32K, and if each cipher text was 64K, then the size of the query has to be two gigabytes. That's, now we are talking about big numbers. Before me, I felt you were not very impressed. I didn't hear it. Yeah, it was small. 64K. But now, because I'm, this is the problem I'm having, is always, it's the scale. So once I get to 32K, we get a scale problem. The second one is, even if two gigabytes, maybe it's not unreasonable. But the problem is that we have to store this for every one of the clients now. So it's the query size times the number of concurrent users, because we have 32 people talking to each other at the same time. Not the same one talking to multiple people, but I am talking to somebody. And so there is all this communication. So there are 32K queries that are coming. So now we are talking about 64 terabytes of data that need to be stored at the client at the server. Now we have a very serious problem. So PIR is great. The idea is very appealing. But practically, scale-wise, it's a challenge. And this is kind of what I'm interested in, is how to scale things. And that's what I, th is the purpose of the tutorial. If you don't get the details, what's important is at a high level. It is, it's not because we think it's good performance, it's just good performance. Good performance is a challenge because of these issues. Okay, so let's try and think about, I'll make this one at a time. So first, let's try and reduce the size of the query. We are not the first people to observe this problem. Other people had talked about it. And I'm just going to take a diversion because it's an interesting solution which has applications in other places. If you have a query that is a long vector, that's what we're dealing with. And we are multiplying times a database that's also a long vector. Instead, what we can do is we can look at the whole thing as a two-dimensional problem. So think of the database as two-dimensional instead of one-dimensional. Instead of A, B, C, D, just one long thing, we can put it in a four-by-four four matrix. That's doable, yeah? Now, instead of sending one query, which was of size n, I'm going to send two queries, each of them of size Did anybody guess? Yeah. 
square root of n. It's really, so it's square root of n. So I'm going to have a query, two queries, each of them the size of the side of this square. So basically the square has n entries. So each side is square root of n, square root of n times square root of n is n. So that's what, this trick has been done before. So I, that's why I think it's interesting. So now I can have zero. I'll put, I'm interested in entry g. So I'm going to put a zero here and a zero here. And then I'm going to multiply first by the rows and I'll get the second row. And then I multiply times the column. I can add them to get a um, concise representation and then multiply times the other vector and I get the g. So two times square root of n now gives me the answer. So I've reduced the complexity from n to square root of n. That's good. Uh, that's not our work. Other people have done this. So that's really great. However, the result is actually the double encoding of the data itself. Each encoding expands it by size of q divided by p. So the results ends up being bigger even. So we have so this technique, although it's nice from a query sending point of view, you end up doing and needing more space at the storage device. So there is a trade-off between the query and the result size. These were ideas that were developed in the 90s and were actually used in XPIR. So until 2016, these techniques were being used. CLPIR has another technique which compresses it actually to one cipher text. I'm not going to go into details, but it basically results in significant improvements in transmission. However, the query needs to be expanded a lot more. You have to do it recursively several times. So what we are now what are we going to do in our fast PIR? So remember 0 and 1. You remember the vector that the client is sending. It's zeros and ones. These are really vectors, yeah? So, so it's a vector which is going to have an encoding, yeah? So it looks like this, maybe. So four entries, it's several entries. It's not just one. It has to be represented as a vector of size n. So n here is equal to four. So zero is going to be represented using a whole vector of size n. One is going to be represented as a whole vector of size n, zero, etc. There's a lot of zeros, but that's the trick. We have to fool the server. So remember, this is what we're going to, we are trying to do. I'm multiplying a vector which has only one entry and I'm getting uh, the value that I want. Let's focus on this part. So assume that the ciphertext is n is equal to four and the database has eight entries. So this is my database. It has n entries. In our experiments, we'll use 32K, but these are... And then n is equal to 4. So each ciphertext has four entries, each of them modulo q. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create n, which is the, no, the size of the database, divided by capital N, which is the size of the vector, cipher queries. What does this mean? I'm going to have, instead of this vector of one eight, seven zeros, and one, one. I'll have two vectors. In this case, it's eight divided by four, but you can do the math for anything. And you end up with a one and then zeros, and the other one zeros. So I've just divided my query in a certain way. Now what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to start multiplying. I'm going to multiply it row, column by column. Component by component. So we end up multiplying this vector times the first column. So I end up with an A1 and then zeros. And then I multiply the, a zero vector times this, uh, this column and I end up with all zeros. 
and I keep on doing this for each of the columns. So this is the intermediate result. Hold off here. What am I gaining out of all this? Remember, this is a much smaller type of vector. It's, so the query size now has been divided by, so if n is equal to 32 and n is equal to 4k, then the naive approach required 32 times 4 times 16, which was 2 gigabytes, while now, instead of this n, I have n divided by n. So I'm multiplying times 32 divided by 4k, so that's 8 times this. So instead of 2 gigabytes, I'm down to half a megabyte. Okay? This is by just doing the trick of of breaking it, kind of bringing the vector to correspond to each of the columns instead of looking at it as the entire stretch of things. So that's good, but like I said before, reducing the query size is not that big of a deal. The numbers are megabytes, even when they are gigabytes, it's not the end of the world. The problem is the intermediate results. So look at what I ended up with. I ended up with this, which is still the same original size. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add all the cipher text in each column. So if I add this cipher text with all the rest of the cipher text, they're all zeros. The server doesn't know this. This is a secret we have, we know, but he doesn't know. He, the server still has to do the work to hide the privacy. So I can add all of these, and all of this is not going to affect me at all in terms of the content of the data that I'm interested in. That's because I know what's in it. And I can do this for all the columns. Now I have, instead of, how many? I had uh, n, n by n, yeah. Entries, now it's only one of them. So the result size is n times n, which is n square, which is basically this, which is 256 megabytes for our problem of 32K. Still not good enough. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to combine Remember, the problem was that I had terabytes. Remember, that was the big thing, is the, the query size was really 32K. There were all these big numbers that were being thrown at me, thrown at you. Now, I haven't used, I've only been using addition and scalar multiplication. I haven't used rotation. Now I'm going to start using rotation. So I'm going to take this set of vectors, and I'm going to rotate them, each of them in different rotations. So the first one I'm going to rotate by one with a key of one. The second one I'm going to rotate by two with a key of two. And the third one, and then I'm going to add them all together. Now I end up with one vector, which is all good information. There's not all this zeros that were just filling up space without passing any useful information. This is, I mean, it took you, it took us a while, it took Ishtiach a while to just manipulate all these things to get to the right concise representation. Unfortunately, this is not the end of the story because the size of the ciphertext is actually very good now. It's 64K, and it is all good, honest information. The content is actually excellent. We've dramatically reduced the query. I've given you this, but also the result size. The problem is that we've used so many rotations, and practically 
doing all the processing ends up being too expensive. Let me explain you why. Basically, it is computationally expensive, and the amount of noise also expands a lot. So this naive idea has to be done better. Each rotation, this was some magic, but it's part of the homomorph fully homomorphic encryption, the BVF, which is that it needs a public key of size two times the ciphertext. That's a big size that has to be sent over. And n rotations, like what I did before, each of them will require n ciphertexts. So practically, we did some experiments, and you end up having 90%, 95% or 90% of the time basically being spent on just doing rotations, moving these things around in the right way. OK, how do we reduce the number of rotations? So I needed a public, a key, a private key that can help me for rotation of size one, rotation of size two, rotation of size three, rotation of size four, rotation of size n. If I give you something, I tell you I want to do rotations and uh, I have to do it for n and I don't want to really send you n different keys. How would you, could you think of some way, some more, maybe more efficient number of rotations that every number can be, how can you represent numbers? How are numbers represented? A binary, yeah? Okay, it's getting very late at night, but basically, if I have a certain number of rotations, I need to do 40, 15 rotations. Then I could do 8, and then 4, and then 2, and then 1. So by doing the binary expansion, figuring out the representation, instead of requiring 15 different rotations, I can use log n rotations and keys to do rotations. So basically, if I have this, here I have n is equal to 8 to make the numbers look interesting. So then I, the tr traditional approach, or what I described before, would have been to, uh, to, to rotate them, each of them. So I would need eight different rotations before I can do the addition. So what are we going to do? We are only going to send log n keys. This is a trick every computer scientist just loves to do all the time. Yeah. So I'm going to send log n. In this case, I'm going to send 4. And here on the bottom, I've written the number of rotations that you want to do. Yeah. So this one needs 7 rotations. This one needs 6, etc. I should. I'm running out of time. I'll finish. Don't worry if you have the stamina. I'm almost there. So every number here can be represented as an expansion of powers of 2. So 2, 2 plus 1, 4 plus 1, 4 plus 2 plus 1. Yeah, I can do all these things. So I can use only that many things, but I have to do several rotations. I have to do this one once. This one I'll have to do it once. This one I'll have to do it twice. This one I'll have to do it twice. This one I'll have to do it three times. So I end up being approximately n log n times log n rotations that I need to do. So I've saved on the number of keys, but I've lost on the number of rotations. Instead of doing eight, I end up doing n times and log n, yeah, because each of them, in the worst case, requires log n. OK, so we have to sweat and work a little bit more to finish this lecture. So we're going to try and reduce the number of rotations again also. I've reduced the number of keys to log n. Now I'm going to reduce the number of rotations. Here is your original thing. 
each of the odd ones rotate by one. Or it looks like the even, yeah? So rotate this one, rotate this one, rotate this one, rotate this one. Each other one rotate by one. Now, remember, rotation is the challenge. Addition isn't such a challenge. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add each pair together. So I'm going to add the first two, the second two, the third two. And I'm taking advantage of the zeros. Remember, this is what I'm re I know where the zeros are. So I end up with four vectors now. Because my goal wasn't just rotation, was eventually to add. So I'm going to do the adding while doing the rotations and taking advantage of the addition during my rotations. So now I have these vectors. Now I can rotate the, the even ones by two, power of two, yeah? So I'm going to rotate these two, and I end up in this situation. Now I add each two together next to each other. And I end up with this vector. And now I rotate the last one just once by four, my last one. Which, so I'm really combining the needed rotations, the powers of two needed rotations on the individual ones. And you end up with two vectors. You add them, and you end up with one vector. And I've only done n rotations. And this is a, a great. This is very nice. So I have a query size which is relatively small, half a megabyte, but the response size is very small. It's very concise. So I'm just going to end it. Basically, we did some experiments on this. And uh, basically, we have clients. We have uh, uh, we compare with Pung, various uh, Pung, and we had we are in the West Coast. We had the server in the East Coast. We had communication happening. You, you, we used all this in AWS. And x-axis is the number of users. Y-axis is the 99th percentile for latency in seconds. And we really want for communication to get under one second type of communication. So if you look at it, this is ours, and all these are variations on Pung, which was the main competition before us. And if you look at here, this value is just under a second. So we end up with 32K users and having communication under a second. It's actually significantly under a second, so it's quite, quite nice. So hiding meta information is very important. Just hiding the content is not enough. This is one message I'd like you to remember, even if you didn't understand anything I said. Worry about access. Worry about meta information. We cannot just talk about encrypting the content. Because access patterns have been established to reveal information. We really used PIR. And I would like to say PIR is a very useful technique, not only here, but we demonstrated it here at a scalable way. Using a novel architecture, we hope we can use it in other environments for database applications. Other people can use it. And what is critical is that we were able to develop within it all these different techniques that I spent most of my time describing to make it more efficient. And so PIR, although it sounds like magic, it can be done. It's really this multiplying a vector with a single one times a database. You just have to do it efficiently. And the problem we database people have is that we have to scale. So I think I'm done. If you have questions, I can take them.
I'll be around also the next few days, so you can, if you are hungry, you're exhausted, I'm fine. You can do whatever, but I'm happy to take questions. You're exhausted. You can go. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah.